Hi, everybody, and welcome to Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments, where we invite leaders from our investment team to offer their analysis of the investment landscape and the economic outlook. I'm Jay Diamond, head of thought leadership for Guggenheim Investments, and I'll be hosting today. We are recording this episode on March 31st, 2022. Our podcast today will start with a timely discussion with Steve Brown, Guggenheim's Assistant Chief Investment Officer. As our post-pandemic economy roars ahead, the Fed makes a hard pivot to tighter monetary policy and war unfolds in Ukraine, the markets suffered a brutal first quarter. Steve shared with us his thoughts on these market dynamics, the advantages of active portfolio management in times like these, and makes the case for bonds now. Steve, along with global CIO Scott Minard, CIO for fixed income Ann Walsh, and the rest of the investment team, is responsible for $234 billion in fixed income assets as of December 31st in institutional accounts, insurance company portfolios, mutual funds, and other products. Also joining us is Jerry Tsai, a vice president in our macroeconomic and investment research group, who will bring us up to date on economic developments, and Aditya Agrawal, managing director and head of our agency mortgage-backed securities sector team, who will give us an update on this market sector that will be directly affected by the Fed's balance sheet strategy. Let's begin with our conversation with Steve Brown. Welcome, Steve, and thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me. Of course. To set the stage for our chat today, uh, can you describe the environment in which we find ourselves? How did we get here? There have been kind of three main drivers of volatility over the past, call it 90 days, but really some of it extends back to the fourth quarter of last year. You know, first and foremost, and this was a, a pressure we were feeling last year, was uh, inflationary pressures in a tight job market, you know, largely as a result of a, of a strong economy here in the U.S., but also, of course, uh, a, a remnant, if you will, of some of the supply chain issues that have been brought about uh, uh, over the course of the pandemic. You know, two, the market's response to uh, really a shift in, in Fed policy, if you think back to Q4 of last year, you know, the Fed was projecting very limited action uh, with regards to the overnight rate, hadn't even discussed the balance sheet yet. You know, fast forward to the first, literally the first week of, of this year, and, uh, you know, the Fed minutes came out, which, of course, um, gave a little bit of window into their thinking on potentially moving on the balance sheet and moving relatively quickly, and then obviously kind of setting a, a a path for for potentially higher short-term rates in in much shorter order than the market was expecting, uh, and then really three, you know, which came about in in February uh, was of course the the war in Ukraine and the breakout of of war in Europe. So you know those are three um, very different and interrelated dynamics that have really really caused a lot more market volatility than the market's been used to over the past couple of years, and in particular with the, with the shift in the Fed, it's almost a, a different playbook is in order in some ways. Um, you know, I think speaking, though, bro more broadly to how we're thinking about the economy and some of the more underlying data uh, that, I've worked, uh, that I gloss over or reference there, you know, on the economic front, we have very strong GDP growth here still in the U.S. Fourth quarter GDP came in at 7%. And uh, we have very high uh, inflation, the highest we've seen in, in over a generation. You know, the latest CPI print for headline CPI was 7.9%, highest since uh, 1982, and 6.4% for core CPI, also the highest since 1982. Uh, as I briefly mentioned earlier, the job market is extremely tight as well with the unemployment rate at 3.8%, as we've seen one of the quickest drops in unemployment in history. And initial job, jobless claims, in fact, last week were 187,000, the lowest since 1969. So, you know, this backdrop, of course, is what's leading the Fed to, to pivot their policy and withdraw the accommodation that, as I mentioned, the market has been used to for the better part of two years. You know, first, they tapered asset purchases. You know, they just raised rates for the first time in, uh, in, in uh, four years uh, in, in March. 
and um, and later this year they're likely to begin to, to shrink their balance sheet. So you know, those are the primary factors at play, uh, which are multifaceted. And then of course the Ukraine uh, and the the war in Europe is one of the ones that's one of the variables that's uh, of course uh, human cost and tragedy aside, very hard to determine what it will mean on the geopolitical front going forward, or more immediately what it means for supply chains and even just for for demand and consumption, not only in Europe, but uh, across the rest of the globe. So clearly a lot of unknowns. Uh, the markets generally don't like the unknowns and tend to, to reprice in environments when there are unknowns, and, and uh, that's the environment that we so uh, very a uh, lot going on. What has been the response of, of the markets to all of this? Yeah, you know, it's been um, a particularly challenging quarter for for fixed income, but but also for equities. Uh, really, risk assets have repriced. You know, we're sitting here in in, in late March, and and uh, some of the repricing has has retraced a bit, but. Maybe starting first with the bond market and, and fixed income more broadly. You know, Q1 is on pace for the worst quarterly uh, Treasury index performance over the past 50 years. You know, the prior worst was uh, Q1 of 1980. Uh, and for the Bloomberg uh, Barclays aggregate, as it's now called, this is the worst quarter uh, on record and uh, the worst quarter we've seen actually since last Q1. Um, which at the time felt hard, but uh, relative to this quarter, uh, you know, seems much less severe. Uh, you know, we think, I mean, in, in short, Treasury yields and yields across uh, all of credit have moved higher. Now, the 10-year yield, for example, is up close to 2.5% now. It's retraced a bit in the last couple of days, but it's moved from basically 1.5 to 2.5. And the two-year yield moved from basically 50 basis points, or right around there, a little over a quarter ago, to now two and a half. So you've seen 100 to 200 basis points in moves across the yield curve, uh, which is abnormal amount of volatility. Really kind of seeing just a, a general repricing of, of the whole yield curve. And in fact, 2.10's curve briefly inverted the other day, 5.30's curve inverted as well. Uh, 5.30 hadn't inverted since 2006, and 210s hadn't inverted since 2019. And I think that's one of the things that we wanted to talk about today, clearly, was just the backdrop for fixed income and, and for, for nominal yields and, and credit spreads. You know, all look really quite attractive to us, particularly given the backdrop of a strong economy. Yes, the Fed is taking away accommodation. Yes, the Fed is broadly time, trying to tighten financial conditions. Um, but you now have nominal yields at places where they haven't been uh, in a number of years. You have spreads relatively wide, and you have dollar prices that have fallen in, in just about everything. And so I think it, it's changed the paradigm for investing in, in fixed income and in credit, particularly yep. relative to some of the other risk assets that have uh, that have recovered. So, uh, Steve, just the, the strength of the sell-off, though, uh, has been extraordinary. Um, and it's not just that the Fed is, you know, shifting to a, a, a tighter policy, but there's been a, a significant repricing about expectations for what the Fed is going to do. Isn't that a big part of it? It is, and that's, you know, that's what's driven the the shape, the change in the shape of the yield curve, and then the overall increase in yields. Uh, to your point, you know, we we now have something like nine to ten hikes priced into the yield curve over the next year. You know, that went from if you were to literally rewind a year, you know, there's basically there was essentially zero hikes priced in. And even if you go back to Q4 of last year, you know, potentially one to two. Yeah, a, a classic bear flattener. Now, how has credit performed uh, through this period? Uh, you know, typically credit spreads are uh, negatively correlated with with Treasury yields or or um, it tend to be a ballast, right? So if you think about, uh, you know, in, in, in environments where yields are broadly rising, you know, typically that's because we're in a tightening cycle and the Fed is tightening for the right reasons, trying to slow down an overeating economy or just tightening policy in a strong economy. Uh, and so spreads tend to typically tighten in that environment. We've seen the opposite so far this year. So uh, credit spreads have widened. So you have this unique 
environment where treasury yields are rising, the risk-free rates rising, and spreads are widening. Uh, that's back to one of my original points on a different playbook for this year. Uh, you know, investment-grade corporate bonds, for example, are down close to eight or nine percent on a total return basis this year. That's after they were uh, negative last year. So it's two straight years of so far negative performance. This is the worst performance since uh, 1980 that we've seen in, in investment-grade bonds. And really, um, it's not just duration that's driving uh, bond prices lower. It's, it's spreads, which we'll we'll get to when we talk about the opportunity set. You know, high yield corporate bonds, obviously a more credit sensitive market, uh, but one with generally lower duration has outperformed investment grade on a total return basis, but is still down 5%. Uh, you know, the asset classes that we've tend to favor more over the last year, year plus, including corporate bank loans and securitized credit, you know, generally those shorter duration asset classes have still widened from a spread perspective and still have negative total returns, but they're much more muted, you know, total returns down 50 basis points, 100 basis points, or you know, upwards of 200 basis points. So, uh, com performed comparatively pretty well, um, and uh, have been much more stable because they haven't had the price dislocation from uh, duration and from from higher yields. So, post this widening, you've seen you now have credit spreads from a valuation standpoint in the 30th to 50th percentile range, and in some in some periods this year, you've had them north of 50 percent, meaning that we're in an environment now where going back over time, spreads tend to be tighter than they are today. And in particular, spreads tend to be tighter than they are today in non-recessionary environments. And I think that's what's key to the underpinning of our view going forward is we don't see an immediate high risk for a recession. Uh, and therefore, fundamentals should remain strong, defaults should remain low, and it's a good time to be in risk assets. So Given all of this, Steve, you know, let's focus on what you and your team as active fixed income managers are doing during this environment. Yeah, I think, you know, first things first is determining if the market moves and repricing of risk assets does anything to change, uh, you know, our forward-looking view on our allocation to those asset classes. And then, as I just mentioned, you know, have we made any changes to our medium to longer term views about the trajectory of the economy. And so starting with point number two, we haven't, uh, you know, we haven't changed our view on, um, on the economy. And then as active fixed income managers, obviously one of the things we're trying to focus on is, is risk mitigation. So in an environment where you're seeing heightened volatility, it's understanding uh, the risks and the biases that you have within your portfolio obviously being able to quantify them and maintaining your targets. So importantly, and as we saw spreads widen, you know, we haven't been net sellers by any, by any means. In fact, we've been looking at these as opportunities to buy. Uh, and when it comes to our uh, duration positioning and how we're positioned across the curve, you know, we've been positioned for a flatter yield curve. And, uh, and so as short-term rates have risen and long-term rates have risen not as fast, you know, that potentially is changing the calculus for how we want to be positioned going forward. Um, but, uh, you know, that basically the view is, has come to fruition and, and, you know, that positioning has paid off. So I think, you know, in thinking about relative performance um, to our benchmarks, you know, it's obviously customized per client and per strategy. Um, but uh, our bias towards being predisposed to owning credit, to liking credit, and to buying on weakness, that playbook for us for now hasn't changed given our constructive view on the economy and our constructive view on valuation. Great. And perhaps unsurprisingly, though, during this time, not everyone uh, is as uh, thoughtful about the opportunity set, and we've seen you know, outflows from bond funds across the board. Um, and what information would you want to make sure that bond fund investors had as they consider the case for bonds today? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are a couple points to make here, really. You know, first, the, the, the sell-off has uncovered a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, to your point, we've um, been fortunate to not be for sellers. Yes, we've broadly seen outflows out of bond funds. But it's been relatively orderly. 
And as such, the credit markets, while volatile at times, have um, you know behaved for the most part. Uh, but that it is it is a powerful position to be in uh, to be a buyer of risk when others are selling risk. So, um, you know, I think the return distribution for fixed income has, has broadly shifted to the right. So regardless of what you think about the path for interest rates or credit spreads from here, you know, we now have these higher nominal yields as a starting point, uh, which should, uh, for your baseline expectation, increase your, your nominal expected returns. So, you know, I think in a backdrop where other asset classes like equities you know, and or commodities have, you know, held in relatively well, at least at this point in the, the quarter, uh, you know, fixed income can again be a, a strong complement to a portfolio. And over the long run, there are significant diversification and correlation benefits to investing in fixed income. And this isn't just from a starting yield perspective. This is also now, you know, fixed income can a, again be a total return uh, asset class. Of course, over time, based on prevailing rates and spreads, you know, dollar prices fluctuate, but you know, we're now kind of in an under par market across most of, of credit, which is a unique position and not one uh, that we're always in. And in particular with the supply that we've seen over the last couple of years and with the relatively low yields associated with that uh, supply, you now have in some cases significant discounts uh, that even just some sort of normalization of yields uh, would re would re result in excess returns uh, above your um, you know above your expected yield. I think too the floating rate allocation that we have, uh, you know we've invested in floating rate leveraged loans, structured credit loans. About half loans half of loans have LIBOR or SOFA floors, meaning their the the rate that they're reset on has some sort of base uh, floor to it. Uh, we're now basically through those floors. Uh, based on prevailing interest rates. And so the net uh, increase in rates from here on out will flow directly through to the coupon. And in structured credit, you typically don't have floors, so those coupons have been rising uh, as short-term rates have risen. So you're, you're starting to have income building, uh, not just from a resetting of yields further out the curve, but from higher short-term rates. You know, I think second, uh, you know, we manage a number of open-end funds and open-end strategies. So, of course, maintaining sufficient liquidity uh, is in order. Uh, you know, we are relatively constructive, as I've noted, in this current backdrop and, and with this market dynamic. But you have to prepare for the unexpected. So have your plans uh, set in place uh, for if things go against the way you're thinking. Uh, so that's, um, you know, something we've spent a lot of time on. You know, third, I've already mentioned it briefly earlier, but, you know, bonds in particular with higher yields, you know, play an important role in a diversified portfolio. Over a rolling three-year horizon, bonds and equities have been negatively correlated now for over 20 years. So, as if you're in a, the seat of a multi-asset allocator, I think the, the attributes of bonds, uh, particularly when other asset classes have held up relatively well, or is, is an attractive uh, environment now, and then fourth, you know, finally, what, how, you know, how much worse could it get from here? How much wider could spreads get? How much higher could yields get? You know, whether the sell-off in bonds is over or not. Obviously, that's uh, the, the the hardest question to answer. But preparing for environments, if yields do get higher, if spreads do get wider, and laying out the path for what we would do at each portfolio level and at the strategy level, you know, is something that we're always doing and is a part of what led to our significant outsized returns in 2020 when we were very under risk and then when the price of risk changed went overweight risk you know those plans were laid uh, months or even quarters in advance so always having a playbook for the different environments and an idea of what you're going to do and when you're going to do it and at what levels uh, you know is important to have particularly in this environment where you're seeing significant repricing of assets uh, very quickly. You know, that's the one thing that uh, I can't stress enough has been how fast market prices have moved in relatively stable uh, assets like treasuries, for example. Uh, you know, you've seen a significant move in these asset classes, and so you need to be ready if you get to the targets that you have in mind. 
So, so again, you, you would be a, a buyer in an environment like this. Obviously, it's been a painful quarter to get here, um, no question, but you would be a buyer at these levels. That's right. And I think, you know, one point I haven't made is just on the pricing, the relative pricing of credit risk. Take high yield, for example. You know, and I think the, the resetting of spreads so far has been mostly technically driven and influenced primarily by duration. You see that from the uptick in trading volume in index products. If you look year over year, uh, uh, most of the credit index ETF trading volumes are up something like 60 to 100%. Uh, synthetic index products like in credit derivatives you know, are up 60 to 70 percent. I'm talking about trading volume. And then the, the activity in the cash markets has been very subdued or basically flat or slightly negative year over year. And that's led to interesting dynamics. Like, for example, double B high yield has underperformed single B and triple C high yield by 200 basis points. So that to us is an indicator of some fundamental or underlying credit stress or worry in the market. It's that when faced with outflows, for example, people maybe are selling, you know, the, the least attractive thing in their book or the thing that's most easily replicatable or replaceable. You know, and in, within high yield, it's generally longer duration, double Bs. And so you've seen things with the least amount of risk, at least from a credit perspective, uh, sell off the most. And that's not just from, from duration uh, attribution. And so... It's signals like these that are telling us that there isn't an immediate underlying issue with credit because, you know, Jay, as you know, with our investment process, you know, we have a team dedicated to credit selection, security selection that's independent of portfolio management and portfolio construction and strategy. So, you know, each asset that makes its way into a portfolio has been independently reviewed and approved for inclusion in any portfolio. And the portfolio manager's job is to pick and choose amongst the approved credits. And when we talk so to the credit team, of course, they're being more diligent in this environment with the number of unknowns, um, but we're, we're still net buyers in this, in this environment. So as a PM and with all these inputs, um, it's just a, you, you've, you've mentioned some of these, but uh, go over again for us, you know, where you're going to be looking for the best value right now in a fixed income portfolio. Yeah, and I mean, it depends on the strategy, but um, when you think about what's, in short, it's kind of what's underperformed so far on the year, so as kind of the net incremental ads that we're looking at. So within corporate credit, you know, that would be uh, preferred, for example. You can invest in you know, the highest quality bank preferred uh, at yields you haven't seen in years and at significant discounts. Uh, that uh, if, if the securities were to be taken out at their next call, you would have significant upside a away from preferred, even just investment grade uh, corporate bonds and, and high yield. As I mentioned earlier, on a relative basis, look significantly cheaper than they have in years. You know, the core holdings to, to loans and structured credit and other floating rate assets, I think, remains a, a staple within the portfolios because they're doing what we expected them to do. They haven't really sold off, and uh, their yields are increasing as short-term rates are rising, and so they're acting like a defensive allocation in a volatile market environment. So I think it's a mix of keeping your defensive allocation along with trying to uh, invest more in those asset categories that, as I said, have, have sold off disproportionately and widened to where they now have total return upside from some sort of spread normalization. Now. Thank you for that. So one last question for you, Steve. Um, you know, what is the most important thing that, that you do every day uh, as you execute your responsibilities uh, as a portfolio manager on all of these uh, investment products? I mean, really, ultimately, it's remembering the trust that our clients have, have put in us. And, you know, we're stewards of their capital. And, the, you know, the investment objective differs by product or strategy. You know, but this is in our capital. It's someone else who's, you know, gratefully entrusted us with, with managing their capital and uh, keeping their objectives in mind. And in some environments, that means capital preservation. And in other environments, it means income or, or total return generation. And so just being able to shift amongst those, uh, you know, those objectives 
based on the market environment for the benefit of our clients and shareholders uh, of our funds is, is exactly what we're trying to do. No, thank you, Steve. Before we sign off, uh, is, is there anything I, I, I should have asked you that I didn't? Any point that you didn't make that you think you need to make? <laughs> no, I, I, I think we covered most of it. You know, our answers will change as the, uh, as the environment changes, and maybe we're in for a, a bout of subdued volatility. And if nothing else, you know, the seasonals are about to shift, uh, and uh, maybe for that reason alone, bonds will, will come back in favor, but we think now is a good opportunity. Well, Steve, we will check in with you again. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, please come back and visit with us soon. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Steve Brown. Next up, we have Jerry Tsai, a vice president in our macroeconomic and investment research group. Jerry, take it away. Thanks, Jay. The outlook for near-term growth remains healthy, but subject to uncertainty sparked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Commodity prices have surged, and consumers' worries about the outlook have intensified. The University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index fell in March to its lowest level since August 2011. The decline was mainly driven by worsening views on the future. While the present situation index fell one point, the expectations index posted a much larger decline of 5.1 points. Inflation, which the war in Ukraine will further exacerbate, appears to be the foremost source of drag on sentiment. The median expected one-year inflation rate in the survey rose to 5.4%, its highest level since 1981. While households with incomes below $100,000 per year are more sensitive to higher consumer prices, the impact of higher prices is also being felt among households with incomes above $100,000. Sentiment among households earning more than $100,000 has fallen more than 15 points over the last two months, while sentiment among households earning less than $100,000 is down only 2.4 points over the same period. According to the survey, half of all households anticipated a decline in real incomes in the year ahead due to the combination of rising prices and less positive income expectations. Against widespread inflation concerns, Fed Chairman Jay Powell's speech at the National Association of Business Economists reiterated the Fed's hawkish tone and commitment to control inflation, paving the way for a 50 basis point hike at the May FOMC meeting. Powell said that there is an obvious need to move expeditiously to return the stance of monetary policy to a more neutral level. In the chairman's view, the labor market is excessively tight, and inflation is much too high and broad-based. Monetary policy is wrong-footed in this environment. The Fed can't rely on hopes that supply chain disruptions will dissipate soon. It needs to act quickly to get back to or even move beyond a neutral setting, and 50 basis point moves will be considered at upcoming meetings. Powell's view was largely echoed by other Fed officials last week including current voting members of the FOMC. We believe the sharp increases in interest rates, sparked by worries over inflation and expectations for aggressive tightening of monetary policy, will contribute to ebbing GDP growth in the coming quarters. Overseas, economic data releases were light last week. The euro area composite PMI decreased slightly in March, above consensus expectations, reflecting a moderation in the manufacturing sector but continued strength in services amid further easing of virus-related restrictions. In the UK, the flash PMI moderated only slightly, surprising consensus expectations significantly to the upside. Still, the slowing in the pace of recovery and the significant weakening in forward-looking components indicate that the war in Ukraine is starting to weigh on European growth momentum. That's all I have. Back to you, Jay. Thanks, Jerry Tsai. Next, we have head of Guggenheim's agency MBS sector team, Aditya Agrawal. Adi, the microphone is yours. Thanks, Jay. There's a lot going on in the agency MBS market with the extreme price action recently impacting both the technical and fundamental picture. Adding the impact from ever-evolving Fed policy 
leads us to a fascinating point in our sector. Starting with a market update, U.S. Treasury rates have spiked higher. MBS spreads are at some of their cheapest levels in recent years after taper tantrum 2.0 just occurred. This combination has resulted in both MBS yields and primary mortgage rates around 50 basis points from their highest levels in the past 10 years. This implies a couple things. First, almost all MBS have negative refi incentive after borrowers refied to lower mortgage rates in the past couple years. And second, duration for the MBS market is among the longest from the past 25 years and are fully extended at these rate levels. In addition, negative convexity for the market is also amongst the least negative. As a result, fundamental analysis is now focused on turnover prepay speeds from existing home sales and equity cash out, both of which we expect to be higher than historical due to higher home price appreciation. This is a net positive as it limits further extension risk and a rate sell-off. Another consequence of higher rates is that the Fed's MBS portfolio will run off slower. Their holdings are concentrated in the lowest coupons that we estimate are 100 to 150 basis points below current mortgage rates. Net buying from the Fed has ceased, so they are only reinvesting paydowns at this point. We await further guidance on their plan to reduce the portfolio. However, MBS sells could make sense at these or higher rate levels to ensure their portfolio is decreasing at a desired pace. So while Fed and geopolitical risks remain, we think agency MBS valuations are now cheap after the relentless widening year to date. They are an interesting investment to consider as the Fed hikes rates and removes liquidity from the market. First, MBS carry favorably versus US Treasuries or bullet bonds in a flat or inverted yield curve environment as roll down carry vanishes for similar bullet bonds in the 5 to 10 year duration bucket. We think the Fed taper is well priced in the MBS market at these levels. Cells are unlikely to make a big impact if they are purely to compensate for slow runoff of their MBS portfolio. Valuations are attractive compared to the past 12 years. And lastly, a decline in elevated realized and implied rate volatility will be a catalyst for tighter spreads, in our view. Both banks and money managers have ample capacity to absorb lower issuance in this higher rate environment. Also, both absolute and relative valuations are better than in the past where they have added actively. To summarize, we think this is an environment to revisit adding exposure to MBS, even though Fed is embarking on an aggressive hiking cycle and potential reduction in MBS holdings. In our view, the sector is already pricing it well and we see relatively limited left tail risks at current valuations. That's all I have. Back to you, Jay. My thanks once again to Steve Brown, Jerry Tsai, and Aditya Agrawal. And thanks to all of you who joined us for our new podcast. I'm Jay Diamond, and we look forward to gathering again for our next episode of Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments. In the meantime, for more of our thought leadership and videos, including the CIO Outlook by Scott Minard, our global CIO, visit GuggenheimInvestments.com slash perspectives. So long. Important notices and disclosures. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. Stock markets can be volatile. Investments in securities of small and medium capitalization companies may involve greater risk of loss and more abrupt fluctuations in market price than investments in larger companies. The market value of fixed income securities will change in response to interest rate changes and in market conditions, among other things. 
Investments in fixed income instruments are subject to the possibility that interest rates could rise, causing their value to decline. High yield securities present more liquidity and credit risk than investment grade bonds and may be subject to greater volatility. Investors in asset backed securities or ABS, including mortgage backed securities or MBS and collateralized loan obligations or CLOs, generally receive payments that are part interest and part return of principal. These payments may vary based on the rate loans are repaid. Some asset-backed securities may have structures that make their reaction to interest rates and other factors difficult to predict, making their prices volatile, and are subject to liquidity and valuation risk. CLOs bear similar risk to investing in loans directly, such as credit, interest rate, counterparty, prepayment, liquidity and valuation risks. Loans are often below investment grade, may be unrated, and typically offer a fixed or floating interest rate. This podcast is distributed or presented for informational or educational purposes only and should not be considered a recommendation of any particular security, strategy or investment product or as investing advice of any kind. This material is not provided in a fiduciary capacity, may not be relied upon for or in connection with the making of investment decisions and does not constitute a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. The content contained herein is not intended to be and should not be construed as legal or tax advice and or a legal opinion. Always consult a financial, tax and or legal professional regarding your specific situation. And herein are subject to change without notice. Forward-looking statements, estimates and certain information contained herein are based upon proprietary and non-proprietary research and other sources. Information contained herein has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but are not assured as to accuracy. No part of this material may be reproduced or referred to in any form without express written permission of Guggenheim Partners LLC. There is neither representation nor warranty as to the current accuracy of nor liability for decisions based on such information. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Guggenheim Investments represents the following affiliated investment management businesses. Guggenheim Partners Investment Management, LLC, Security Investors, LLC, Guggenheim Funds Distributors, LLC, Guggenheim Funds Investment Advisors, LLC, Guggenheim Corporate Funding, LLC, Guggenheim Partners Europe Limited, Guggenheim Partners Fund Management Europe Limited, Guggenheim Partners Japan Limited, GS Gamma Advisors, LLC, and Guggenheim Partners India Management.